Code Emotion. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming on a beautiful Saturday evening, uh, morning, I mean, to my presentation. Uh, we're going to be talking about Node.js. But before we talk about that, I want to tell you why you should even listen to me. Um, who am I? I'm a software engineer and entrepreneur from Toronto. It's a long way from here. Uh, founder of Dynamatic, we're a, a design development consulting firm. We develop mobile and web apps. I'm also on the tablet team on Kobo. Does anyone know about Kobo? <coughs> yeah. Yes. So yeah, uh, I'm, I work on the Kobo Arc team, and we just launched the Arc in November, I think. And I've been a Node.js developer for about two years, uh, one and a half to two years, actually. And I've been blogging at phaselabit.com, tweeting at phaselabit. Basically, search my name, you'll find me, and you can get in touch with me, ask me any questions you want. A few, few things I've done, most of these are in uh, Node.js, running in the back end, except for the Kobo arc. From right to left, my right, uh, just a match field was my first startup, and then some apps we've developed for clients and for myself. Uh, and uh, again, Node.js powered. This was actually a Node Knockout. Did anyone here participate in Node Knockout? I don't know if there was a Node developer. Uh, so this was made in 48 hours at Node Knockout. We won second place for design. And this is another uh, Node.js powered app, Windows Mobile powered app. So we're fairly, we're using Node.js everywhere uh, in, in our stack. So before that, I want to get understanding. Does anyone know Node.js already? Like, has anyone programmed in Node.js? Yes. OK, that's great, a few people. So you guys might be bored. The rest of the people might learn something new. So what is Node? Node is a, it's a powerful platform to let your JavaScript run on the server side. Now, when people first heard of that, it's like, JavaScript running on server side, really? Do I really want that? It gets complicated and stuff. But it might be slow. But technically, it's, it's taking JavaScript. And what it's doing is running it on Google's V8 engine. And V8, as we all know, powers Google Chrome, and it's super fast. And so what JavaScript, what Node.js does is it takes your JavaScript and it compiles it down in, while running in just-in-time compiler to C, essentially. So your code is as fast as C, assuming you code it right. It's a great way to build modern web apps in JavaScript. So you can have JavaScript on the client side, and you can reuse most of your libraries on the server side. Right? It's pretty powerful. You don't. You know, when I was doing ColdFusion or PHP back in the day, it was like, OK, got to do all my code here. Then some stuff that you do want to reuse, you can't really reuse JavaScript code in your ColdFusion or PHP only API backend. So using Node.js, it's really easy to do that. What can you do in Node? You can actually do anything you want. It's as comparable to Ruby, PHP, ColdFusion. It's whatever you want to do. You can build chat servers. You can build analytics servers. You can build crazy fast backends. And what I mean by that is, speaking from experience, when I was a ColdFusion developer, when we wanted to deploy a ColdFusion instance, it was, you know, we go to Amazon EC2, we fire up like a two, meg, a two gig instance, right? It costs us about 90 bucks a month. Node.js, when we're prototyping and even deploying for smaller clients, we're essentially deploying on free Amazon instances, right? These things are running 128 megs. And because Node.js has a small memory footprint, and, Jav and it, usually your JavaScript apps, Node.js apps, are really lightweight, which we'll get into why later. You can develop at a really low cost, or even free if you use services like Node.jitsu or Napfog. And you can build anything you want. And it's not this really, it is really relatively new. It's been out for, I think, three or four years, or even less than that. But it's adopted really well. LinkedIn's using it. So all of LinkedIn's mobile infrastructure is actually using Node.js. They use Node.js in the back end, and they use a templating framework called Dust, which they've open sourced, and they've done all sorts of stuff to it. Dropbox is using it for some stuff. Um, Yahoo uses it. A bunch of other guys use it. So it is powerful. I mean, if those guys can use it, then it, you guys should also. What can't you do? Oh, you can't really do much with Node. On, uh, it, when you run Node, you install Node.js, all you can do is like hello world, and you got basic libraries to access the H you got basic libraries to access the file uh, system, HTTP, SSL, all this cool stuff. But in order to do anything, it's really complicated initially. If you want to build a complete, robust Sinatra type framework, it's quite complicated. But what's interesting is that there's a lot of modules. And we'll get into modules later, but Node.js is really the core fundamental pillar of Node.js is modules. Anyone can build a module and 
it really extends Node.js. So uh, does anyone here use Sinatra? Yeah. Yeah, so Node.js is a framework called Express, which is basically kind of like a clone of Sinatra. And all you do to install it, you go npm install Sinatra, and it's in inside your Node.js project. And there, you, your Node.js has suddenly become a very robust web application framework. If you want to do real time, you don't have to sit there and deal with TCP, IP, and all that nonsense. All you could do is go npm install socket IO. Boom, you have real time functionality. So, and one thing, one thing that's interesting, which we're going to get into now, is Node.js is not multi threaded, right? So, when you, when you think of Cold Fusion, PHP, Ruby, uh, I'm not too sure about Ruby. I haven't really done Ruby, but these other languages, it's, it's very, they're multi threaded. So, you can write something like the following. You can write something like that, right, in a normal, uh, in, say, a PHP application and expect it to run fine for 100 users. Assuming you're not like hitting some sort of bottleneck, it will run fine. You register a user, and then it goes and does lots of complex code and returns a user ID, right? Unfortunately, if you were to run this in Node, what would happen is, in a multi-thread system, it will run fine. In Node.js, this will only work for one user at one time. So say if 100 users ran this script, Node.js would queue all these users up and be like, okay, got to deal with you, here's your user ID. Got to deal with you, here's your user ID. So when I first started dealing with this, I'm like, this is kind of weird, you know, what kind of framework is this? I can only, my app can only handle one user at a time. And what I learned is Node.js is all based on callbacks. And you guys are familiar with the notion of callbacks, right? Returning functions and all that stuff. And so what's interesting is, by using callbacks, if you wanted to make this code run in Node.js fine, you would introduce a callback that returns a user ID, right? And your uh, register user would do some long, complex, slow code and call back the function that you passed in with the user ID. And the way this works is really interesting. What Node.js does is it goes, before in the non-callback way, it said, okay, I'm going to process this user. I'll get to the other guys later. Here's your user ID, then he goes to the other guy. <coughs> Using callbacks, what it does is it has an event stack, some internal stuff that V8 or Node.js is program, the developers of program, takes the callback, puts it on the stack, and goes, that's there, I'll, that will call itself later, I'll go get someone else. So this way what happens is you, you can fire off, well, there's, it's only one thread, but there's stuff happening in the background, and so the callbacks will get called whenever they're done, and your application won't slow down. It's essentially like the web server Nginx. Everyone used Nginx here? <coughs> Most people should have, right? The, you know, Apache, it's the difference between Apache and Nginx. Apache has notion of threads, right? Apache is like the older model where you have PHP and stuff. It's spawning new threads for each request. Nginx completely deals on callbacks and events internally. And so essentially Node.js is the Nginx of programming application servers or whatever. So the, it gets complicated when I first was introduced to callbacks. I come from a very Java base. So Java, you have listeners and stuff. But in terms of web, you don't really have callbacks in PHP Cofusion. So the way I read this now is, great, register user, I pass in a username, pass in a password, and then I pass in a function. If the way I realize if a method or a function is a blocking or non-blocking is I see if it's a callback. If there's a callback in there, then I know that this is going to be safe. Node.js will handle it properly, and I'll be good to go. So the Node.js event loop. So basically, going back, there's this callback stuff. So because Node.js only runs on one thread, there's this event loop that's constantly running. Fortunately, I don't have a diagram for it, but essentially all the event loop does is it goes <coughs> Here, all the event loop is doing is we have a, here I'm creating a basic web server. So every whatever time the event loop cycles, it goes and checks if there's uh, a new request and then it writes a new response and then it ends the response. So here I go, okay, HTTP listen on port 8080. I'm going to create a new server, HTTP.create server, and I'm going to pass in a callback because we're not going to always wait for a request coming. We're going to pass in a proper callback that takes a request and a response. And so internally, what happens is when you connect via, when someone connects to your, browser, someone connects to your web server, 
Node.js internally goes, hey, there is a new connection. It does all the stuff it needs to do, and it calls your callback. It passes in a request object and a response object, right? In this event loop, it's running, it's, it's doing that in one iteration, I guess. And then here you can go, okay, what do I want to do with my response object? I can pass in, great, 200, my servers, this response is great. I'm going to write something, hello code module, and I'm going to end it. You know, that's fine, it's ended. So we can take a look at that quickly. Uh, by the way, if there's any questions in the middle, raise your hand up, I'll answer. Any confusion? Uh, CD event. Uh, So there, it was a simple thing. So the, all that happened in one event loop. It connected, it said, great, there's a new connection. It does all sorts of stuff internally to set up HTTP, and it returns hello code motion. Very easy, very straightforward. Now let's, we can take a look at a more complicated example. Yep. So in, in, in that example, we saw that it just happened. What we can actually do is really intercept all these events. Node.js, other than callbacks, is based on events, right? And so whenever something happens, there's always an event. Node.js is always creating events. For example, we, if we didn't want to wait till everything is done, we wanted to intercept it, what we could do is create a new, uh, we could, in uh, ActionScript, does everyone, has anyone used ActionScript here? Right, so in ActionScript you go dot add event listener, then you pass in whatever you're listening to. Node.js you go object dot on, and then on you can pass in what object, what event you're listening to. So here, we're listening to the request event, and again, we're passing in a callback, and we're going, okay, whenever a request is made, I wanna do 200 response right code motion. But before that, a connection is made. And you can figure out all about events if you go to Node.js documentation. They have detailed like HTTP calls this event, that event, this event. So here I'm just listening to on connection. Whenever a connection is made, I can call, I can log to the console, new connection. And essentially what that does is you hit the browser before this is called, it calls new connection and then it calls a request. We can quickly see that. And we'll see some interesting behavior which if you're new to Node, you'll be kind of confused of why that happens. Oh, oops, uh, not custom events. CD event. Okay, so we're gonna go, we're gonna hit it. Returns what we wanted to, but if we look at the uh, console here, there's two new connections, even though I made one connection. and. When I first started Node, I was confused. Why are there two connections? I, my, did my browser make two connections for some reason? Reason why is it actually makes a connection for the favicon, right? Chrome goes, hey, give me the favicon. So there's another connection. So you can see the amount of detailed analytics or information you get from Node is you know when a browser's making a favicon request. If you wanted to, you could just go, if request e uh, path equals favicon, return this favicon, right? You don't have to do all that because there's frameworks like Express that handle all that for you. But if you didn't want to use Express, you want it to be very lean and just have build a web server in like six lines of code, you can handle that. So Node.js, we can listen to events, but it'd be cool if we can create our own events. What will eventually happen and You'll find out, we won't be able to see the depth of that problem in this talk, but once you start writing Node.js applications, you'll quickly see that once you're writing complex applications, you run into a thing called callback hell. And callback hell is basically, because Node.js runs on callbacks, you'll have a callback within a callback within a callback within a callback, and your code will look like the pyramid. It'll just be diagonal, right? And it'll be really, really weird. And so early on when I started writing it, it was like, this is nasty. You know, for example, 
call back out. You make a connection, you, call, you do a query on the database, right? You get a bunch of user IDs back. For whatever reason, you got to run, parse through all those user IDs and get the one that's the smallest user ID. But then, you all, based on that small user, you want to make another query to, to your memcache server and grab a bunch of other data, then do all that. You'll run into a diagonal callback hell. It is really nasty. So what you can do to make your life easier is you can use Node.js's event class, right? So instead of doing callback hell, you go event.emit, which will look at the syntax, and it emits an event where you have another function somewhere later on. So it looks more sane. It's all straight rather than diagonal. Uh, we can see here. So we have a, uh, we have a clash call unleashed. And uh, so we have an event emitter. We go require event. We'll get into the syntax for require right after this. But I import a module. It's just like import. Require events dot event emitter. That's the class or object called. I create a new event emitter object called unleashed. And then I go, OK, whenever unleashed, whenever I hear the listen uh, event start, I open the doors. Whenever I uh, call the event end, I pass in a variable. And if it was good, I go yay. If it wasn't, I go bummer. And then here at the bottom, I'm, I emit the start event, I emit the end event, and I go false. So we can take a quick example. We can run this example, actually. Custom events. Right, so uh, open, let me open up Sublime here. Custom events. So here I'm passing in, can everyone see? Let me move this up actually. Okay, can everyone see the code and? Okay, here's the code, here's the console. So I'm gonna change, I'm gonna change the uh, event emitter to say true. Right, and run the code again, and it just open doors, yay, because it listened to the event. Right? This is a great way. This example might, not, might illustrate the powerful nature of events, but once you do get into callback hell, you'll soon realize events are a great way. There's also other ways. There's promises. Anyone use AngularJS here? Right, so AngularJS is the concept of promises, right? And you, you can use the, the $Q class. You can use the node uh, alternative Q in uh, Node.js. You can also use a class called async, which is basically you set up your functions in a big array and you pass it in and it calls it all at once. We're, you know, cool. I like using events. I like using promises, depending on the situation. Modules. So you might have noticed we use require a few places. Require is interesting. Require is basically <laughs> a way to import the class. You know, everyone here is familiar with importing. Uh, the way you import is, if you just call require HTTP, what it does is it first looks in a folder in your application called node underscore modules. Actually, it first looks into your node installation, because HTTP is a framework class. So it goes to your node installation directory. It goes, hey, is there a HTTP library here? And it goes, OK, not here, assuming it wasn't there. then it would, Look somewhere else. It'll look top level. It'll keep looking at top level till it gets to your application folder. Then it'll be like, hey, in my node modules folder, is there an HTTP module here? If it finds it, it'll return the JavaScript object, and then you'll be able to use it. So for example, here, require HTTP. It goes in the node installation. It goes, hey, HTTP exists there. I'm going to use it. Uh, OK, creating modules. So loading module is really simple. You just go re import or I mean require whatever it's done. Creating module is interesting. Unlike, unlike modern, well not modern, unlike old JavaScript development where you had like app.js and all your classes were in this, Node, ha Node separates everything. So you could essentially use require and you could create object-oriented programming based on that. You can create public functions. You can create private functions. And the way you do that is really simple. You use this keyword called export. Part three, no, part four. Modules. So you can see there's this keyword called exports that I append onto most of the methods here. Whenever I do export, what it tells Node is, great, 
This is a function that I want publicly accessible. It's essentially the, uh, adding the uh, thing in front of your function in Java called public. You can also, there's multiple ways of doing exporting functions. You can go exports.sumpublic method equals function. You can have all your code there. You can also create uh, a function as a variable, JavaScript, everyone knows that. And then you can go export.random name is equal to some random public method. This is confusing. I always found this to be confusing. I don't recommend you do this at all because what happens is you created your variable as some other name, right? You called it some random public method. But when you're exporting it, you, you might accidentally or on purposely go, hey, this is a better name. I'll call it random name. And so when you're looking, when a developer is looking at your code, imagine this is like 600 lines. He comes up to here, he go, he's trying to find random name and he cannot find it unless he does control F, which he'll be able to find it, but it's really confusing, it's really messy. I tend to stick to the syntax at the top where, where it's just exports.sumpublic method is equal to function. Inside the function, I can do all the code there, right? Very straightforward. And what require uh, returns is essentially just a JavaScript object. So we're gonna console.log the object that we require here. The modules. And you can see that it just outputted all my exported functions. Straightforward. Right? You can essentially, like on some complex applications we've run, we've had hundreds and thousands of modules, right? It's really clean. It's a great way to write JavaScript. On the web now, there's require, there's all this other stuff, which you can separate. But in terms of backend, it really, it really helps you organize your code properly. And if you're using something like CoffeeScript or TypeScript, you can actually use the class syntax identifier, and you can create essentially a whole object-oriented programming model based on Node. I know there's a whole discrepancy if JavaScript is object oriented or not. Not gonna get into that. One thing interesting about modules is you can also install new modules, like I said before. What, it's really quick to install modules. Unlike, unlike in the old days, like Java days, where you gotta go online, you gotta download a jar file, put in your project, you Eclipse path. In, mod, in a Node, you go npm install, and npm is bundled with the Node installation, so there's not a separate app you gotta download. npm install, and you just gotta install whatever library you want, Express. And what it does is it creates a uh, request to npm.js, gets Express, gets all its dependencies, and installs it all. Very quick, and what's interesting is this makes it really easy to distribute your application. You can just, you don't have to send over like, I know in the old Java days, probably even now, you zip up your file, there's like 60 jar files, it adds like 10 megs for no reason to your source code, right? What you can do in Node is, when you do express.js, when you go npm install express.js, it, you have this manifest file called um, package.json. And package.json, anyone do Android development here? Package.json is essentially like Android manifest.xml, where you declare all your application details, right? You go, what's the name, what's the GitHub URL, and what's the version, what's the description of the file, all that fun stuff. But then you get into something interesting called dependencies. And you can say what your app is dependent on, right? So here, this app that we're creating is dependent on Express, uh, a module called HBS Handlebars, and another module called Mongoose. Right, Mongoose is a SQL, is a way to connect to SQL databases. So when you do distribute your source code, you just distribute your actual JavaScript source and the package.json. So on GitHub, you always git ignore. Usually we do. We git ignore the node modules folder. And when someone gets this, all they have to do is they gotta go to the directory where they unzip the file or they checked out the folder, uh, package.json, and they go npm install. Whoops. Uh, it's not JavaScript, something's wrong here. Uh, okay. There's, where is it? Here? Row 14. Oh, yep. Perfect. And you go npm install. Oh, no. 
OK, there's something. I'll just go to the other example. Um, Express 3 Twitter. I go npm install. I, uh, what's wrong? Is it because I have no network? Okay. Okay. If it were to work, you'd go npm install. It would go through your package.json file. It would go through your package.json file, file, find all the dependencies, download them all, write to the exact version that you want, and store them in this node modules folder. Right? And it's everything, everything is easily distributable, and you got it working. I got 15 minutes, so I'm going to move on to a more interesting example with Express. So Express.js is a framework that you will always be using, unless you want to use like its competitor, which I haven't really used. It's the Sinatra of Node, and it makes creating web APIs really simple. Usually Node, I've always used it for creating web APIs. I haven't really done much development where Node is actually rendering the HTML template, but we'll get into that example quickly. It's really easy to create a web service. You go require express, you create a new express object, and you go app.get. If it's uh, forward slash, you just say hello world. If it's forward slash conference, and then you pass in a variable name, you go, you can response.send hello name or whatever. Really simple. You can imagine that, you know, I'm not sure how it's done in other languages, in Kofi and PHP, this would take a while to set up, right? You would have to do all sorts of configurations to set this up. In Node, you just go require express, you go app.get, conference, you can also do app.post. So you can go, okay, whenever someone posts something, I can get all the post data and do some cool stuff on it. We can quickly see that here. CD express, uh, node mods. Okay. Hello world, then when I go conference.fazel, and it outputs Fazel. Nothing fancy, but you can see how simple it is to get a whole API built in Node. Very fast, very powerful. If I wanted to, for example, uh, do more stuff with this, this is how it would be without Express. right? If you weren't using Express, you would have to essentially go, if request.url is equal to forward slash, then do all that. If request.index of is conference, you know, do all that stuff. So Express really simplifies API development for you and in general backend development. You can also, what's interesting is you can also do Express templating. So everyone, anyone use JavaScript templating here? Stuff like jQuery templates, handlebars, yeah. So you can get that's all that stuff is client side, right? But what you can get is you can get Node to render server templates server side. And that really, personally, a lot of people prefer client side templating. I prefer server side templating if I am doing templating because it's your server. It's more powerful. Most of the time, it'll be more powerful than the guy's computer, right? So you get, you get a cool template. You can really parse it out or template it out, and it works. There's a lot of template out there, Jade. EJS, Dust, LinkedIn uh, forked it and you know started development on it. Jade, I don't like, not my thing. I like EJS. I like handlebars. Um, so handlebars, everyone should know this if you've used templating. Very simple. The way Node does it is really easy. Also, you go express templates. Very easy to get templates running. You go set views, you pass in where all your templates are going to be. All this code is going to be available online, so you guys can really run all the samples. You can set the view engine, so my templating engine is going to be HPS. If you wanted to do Jade, it could be Jade. If you want to do EJS, it could be EJS. And then here you just go, again, app.get forward slash, and you go response.render message. And message is the, uh, a file name inside the directory public slash views. And I pass in this JavaScript object. And if you go into public views message oh, uh, right here. 
you can see that here, we're going to get to this Twitter example right now. I pass in an array of tweets, and it loops over all the array of tweets, and it shows the text of the tweet. So if we were to see this example running live, CD Express 5. This is the example I had it preloaded before. It just went to my page and it grabbed all the tweets and showed it. Right? This is all really about like 15 lines of code. You built a mini little Twitter app. Kind of useless Twitter app, but you can see that if you had if you wanted to create a simple website up and running that just delivered some information like the latest scores from or the stock ticker or whatever, you can just do this, grab it, and it works. If I want to add some more stuff like my username, it's very easy. Twitter passes in your username. You just pass this back in. This object, uh, user.name, I refresh it, and it has, my, it has my username, and it does some styling on it. Right, very fast. How much? Yeah, okay, we have ten minutes. So, if there's any questions, any questions at all? Usually, I get asked lots of questions. <laughs> no questions. Okay, so I guess that's all. The slides will be available online, uh, and I'll set up the GitHub repo also. Oops. Ah, that's about it. Thank you. Code Emotion.